Okay. All right. So things don't always go as planned, right? Yeah, that's okay. We're going to stay on task, and I'm going to give to you the best that I can what God laid on my heart this week. But I want to bless you with something right as we start here. Uh, one of our teenagers shared with his mom that as I've been teaching about this series about Nehemiah, and he was a wine tester, and then he would taste the wine, and then if he didn't drop over dead, he would give it to the king to drink. But one of our teenagers said this, Nehemiah risked his life for the king, and then risked his life for the king of kings. It's one of our teenagers. I could give you his initials. They are Nathan Schooley. But that's awesome. He's getting it. There we go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the fact that we can come to church and to be encouraged and we can spend time in your word and we can spend time praying as I'm doing right now. And Father, I just pray that what you've laid on my heart, Father, please help me. Please help me to, to just lay it out clearly. And the most important part, Father, is that as we read your word, that it will always have an effect. It will always, it will never come back void is what the promise is. So, Father, help me just stay out of your way and just please use this simple tool this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. I'll get my clicker. All right. <clears throat> okay, so our title this morning is, is gone. But I'm just going to give it to you. Submerge Life and Prayer, Part 3. And believe it or not, we're going to cover one verse this morning out of Nehemiah. Only one verse. Now, if you are a mathematician, you might be sitting here right now going, well, then if he's going to cover one verse the rest of the series, we're not going to finish this up until 2027. <laughs> but anyway, that's not the case. But... Uh, All right, here's, here's, here's a statement. I, I want you to understand that the things of God stirred Nehemiah's heart. The things of God stirred Nehemiah's heart. I, I was, I've been thinking how, how, how we need to allow God to stir our hearts and to, and to allow him to do what he wants to do in my life and in your life and, and with us corporately. And I thought of an example of, of God moving in people's heart from the Old Testament. Please, you might be right now in Nehemiah chapter 2, but stick your bulletin there. And let's head over to Exodus chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35, we're going to look at verses 21, 22, 29, and then jump over to chapter 36 and catch a few others. But Exodus chapter 35, and this one's a pretty easy one to find, Genesis, Exodus, okay? Exodus chapter 35. Verse 21, if you're there, say amen. If you need more time, say wait, pastor, I'm trying to get there. All right, and they came. Everyone whose heart stirred him up and everyone whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation for all his service and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many in Austrasis as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, and I put in here non-electronic, okay? This isn't an electronic tablet they're bringing to the 
bring into uh, to the temple. But and then all jewels of gold, and every man that offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. In verse 29, and the children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses commanded or gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from giving. (laughs) They were told not to give anymore, to stop giving. And then verse 7, For the stuff that they had was sufficient for all of the work to be made, and it was too much. You see, and I should have explained this in a little more detail. They were ready to, to, to create under God's direction and specific instructions the temple, the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the proper term that I should have used there. And they're, they're needing the gold and silver from the people. And, they, and God moved in their heart and they kept bringing it and bringing it and bringing it until Moses finally had to say, stop giving. You'll probably never hear me say that. But he, he said, you've, you've got to stop. But what a beautiful example of God moving in the hearts in the Old Testament. Now, uh, this morning, I, I want to I give you an illustration that God laid on my heart right over here earlier this week. You know, for my word, Cindy dialed this thing all up. I hate to, hate to mess it up, but I'm going to. And this is going to bother you ladies. No, I did not fold it up. Okay, we put it up on this cart so that you could see it. And I hope this goes well. But I tell you what. You and I are born into this world. Oh my, I didn't know if it would just go bloop or not. But anyway, we're born into this world. And this is reality, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we're all born to this world as sinners. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, so then death passed upon all men. And so then here's, here's our heart, and it's being stirred by the only influence we have so far, and that would be Satan, thus the black stick. Okay? You see the heart? Okay. And it's being stirred by Satan. But I tell you what, here's what's really cool, is that God comes into the picture and he stirs your heart to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And he helps you understand that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, 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 and he inserts himself into our life, and, and he shows us another scripture, Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, and so then that influence comes in, and he's stirring our heart. And, and it also says, and for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and he hits us with those scriptures, and he's stirring our heart. Now, here's the problem is that too many times people will say, you know what, I don't want to hear it. And they reject what Jesus Christ did for them on the cross. And then others accept what Jesus Christ did. And God is stirring their heart. And here's, here's, here is, the Bible tells us that we have two natures. So then the old nature and the new nature are both in play. And too many times, you and I, and I'm not pointing my finger just at you, I'm talking about myself too, but too many times, it's like this. And when that is occurring, that doesn't accomplish things for eternity. All that does is cause confusion and heartache in your life. And all that does is, is, is cause you to be frustrated. And, and, and it not only causes you to be frustrated, but then it confuses people all around you and around me. 
But see, you and I can get serious about our relationship with Jesus Christ, and we can allow God to stir our heart, and we can take scriptures such as Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And see, you and I can get serious about our relationship with Jesus Christ, and and we can allow God to stir our hearts. And whatever he does as he's stirring our hearts, whatever he moves in your heart to do, do it. So if he's stirring in your heart to receive Christ, receive Christ. If he's stirring your heart to be baptized, be baptized. If he's stirring your heart to share the gospel with somebody, share the gospel with somebody. But just respond to God stirring his heart and stirring your heart. And with God's help, let's just keep this out of the picture. We still have an old nature, but we can, we can absolutely, if, if, this, if this is your old nature and this is your new nature, and you feed your new nature and you starve your old nature and let this one have more and more influence, right? But see... The man that we're going to be studying, that we're studying now and will continue to study, he allowed God to stir his heart. Let me make you some statements that God laid on my heart this week. I know you don't have it up on the screen, but I still have it in my notes. Listen to this. I hope and pray that we are willing to let God stir our hearts instead of the world stirring our hearts. Something else that God laid on my heart is that you all have been out there under the influence of all of that out there, and then you come in here for just a very short amount of time. Let me plead with you this morning. The only way you can let God stir your heart is if you are are reading his word on a regular basis and praying and pouring your heart out to him, and then he will stir your heart. Nehemiah's heart was stirred because of his prayer life. Then we can accomplish things for eternity. Listen to these other statements. We will pour out our lives. Listen to this. We will pour out our lives, our abilities, our resources into whatever is stirring our hearts. Is that right? Whatever is stirring your heart is where you're going to pour your life, your ability, your resources into that. In this statement, the world stirs our hearts to have short-term thinking, to do temporary things. God wants to stir our hearts to have long-term thinking and to do eternal things. So God stirred Nehemiah's heart through his prayer life. This statement, prayer is the overriding theme of this book and is the dominant reason why Nehemiah did what he did. All right, now listen to this. Here's a statement from last week. One man, stirred by prayer, asked for things that could have gotten him killed, and he did not die. He got those things and more. Listen to this list. He said this. He stood before the king, and he said, I need time off for this building project that you decreed should not happen. Remember that from last week? And this one, I need you to give me letters of protection because I'm going to make a 1,000-mile trip with resources on my camels, I need letters of protection. Oh, and I, <clears throat> and I need to have you supply all the materials for free. That's what he was saying to the king. Nehemiah got all of that and an army escort for a 1,000-mile trip. Yeah, now see, it's not like he was getting an army escort to go from Mark, Iowa to Bloomfield. This is, this is a 1,000-mile trip, and he's given an army escort, letters of protection, letters of saying that he'll get free materials and so forth. God did that. But it was God responding to his prayer life, and it was God that stirred his heart to the, to the point that he would come before the king and risk his life. 
and then risk his life for the king of kings. Yeah. Oh, my word. So look at verse 10 of Nehemiah 2, please. Verse 10 of Nehemiah 2. And I, well, I think most of you are there, but when I read this, I just want you to understand that these guys are just listed here. And we are going to see as we continue to study that they, they continue to give resistance to Nehemiah. But here they're introduced. Verse 10, when Symbolet, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. All right, let me just say this. Now imagine this up here on the screen, okay? If you and I get serious about our relationship to Jesus Christ, get serious about prayer and doing what God stirs us up to do, we can and should experience resistance. This is resistance that's just coming on the scene right here in verse 10. But if you know of any great work that's been done for God, you can go to the individual that God stirred in their heart to do that great work and ask them, did you have resistance? You will get, inevitably, they will say, yes, I had resistance. And they could probably even explain it to you. I want to give you, I can't give you, I keep picking that up. All right, so right now, imagine this picture of Russ Miller up here. You all know Russ Miller? Most of you know Russ Miller. Okay? He stands up in the face of teaching that Genesis, you can take it word for word, and it doesn't mean it by any stretch of the imagination that God had to use evolution to, for his creation. And he stands up and he teaches the truth from from uh, from Genesis as well as other scriptures, but here's some of the resistance that he's faced. The University of Arizona, where he's from, the Arizona area there, students are rewarded with extra credit if they'll go heckle Russ, Russ at his meetings. And the last time that I heard that he was up in Ames, Iowa, students from Iowa State came and heckled Russ because he's teaching the truth. Resistance. Now imagine right now John Stroop is up here. You see him? Come on, work with me here. John Stroop's up here on the screen right now. And listen to this. At one point, Freeway planned on starting a second men's recovery house. And a lady from the neighborhood told John that she was going to ruin his life. A lady from the neighborhood told John that she was not only going to ruin his life, but she would hold daily press conferences in his yard. <laughs> and she would contact John's supporters to stop the support, and she would pass out flyers in the neighborhood to try to keep the men's recovery house out of their neighborhood. The county commissioner called John and reported that 20 families had signed up that they were against the recovery house being in their community, and John sent a statement to each family, and it just simply said this. This, this is John. He said this, none of our men will treat you as badly as you have treated me. And goes on to say, and we have more rules in our house than you have in yours. Yeah, that's John Stroop. And then another picture that I was going to show you, and I really, it's too bad it's not up there because it's got two of my grandkids in it. But this picture you'll see, uh, see right here is Lily. You see Lily? She's really cute. And then here's, here's Ben. You see Ben? Do you see Ben? Okay, and then back behind Ben and Lily is Joshua. Joshua is my son-in-law, and he was the one that was married to Jamie, our daughter. And Josh is a street preacher. And so he'll stand on the street corner and he will read scripture and he'll present the gospel. But a number of people have come along and knocked his Bible out of his hand. Other people have come right up to him in his face and spit in his face. There are other ladies that did some things that I'm not going to mention 
that tried to distract him. But if you ask, if you ask any of those guys I just talked about, Russ Miller, John Stroop, Josh Young, they would tell you that God stirred their heart to do something and they went and did it. And whether they had resistance or not, they were still stirred by God to do it. Uh-huh. Okay, now let's, let's consider Stephen. And I tell you what, I don't know how much of this I'm going to be able to cover, but let, let, me, uh, let me read some of this to you. No, I tell you, yeah, no, yeah, no. Turn to Acts chapter 6, please. Acts chapter 6, verses 7 through 15. Acts chapter 6, verses 7 through 15. Stephen experienced resistance. Those of you that have been reading scriptures for quite a while, you understand exactly where I'm headed with this. But Acts chapter 6, verse 7, if you're there, say amen. Okay, that's most of you, so let me go. I'm going to do this pretty fast, okay? The word of God continued to increase, and the numbers of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And watch this, and, many, and, great, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Wow, that's so cool. Verse 8, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those of Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then he secretly instigated men, they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came up upon him and seized him and brought him before the consul and they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. And for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. All lies, okay? And then gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the angel or the face of an angel. I have never been accused of that. Maybe some of you have, I don't know. But they said his face was like that of an angel. Then go to chapter 7, verse 51 through 60. I'm reading from the ESV on this portion right here, the ESV, Acts chapter 7, verse 51 through 60. You stiff-necked people, he tells them the truth about who they are, uncircumcised in heart and ears, and you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom ye have now betrayed and murdered, and you who received the law was delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried, cried out with a loud voice <clears throat> and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named, what? Saul, which would be, later be Paul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Yeah. All right, now let me move on to this. Listen to this. You know, we, we've discussed John Stroop briefly. And there's some books down here. There's a couple left, and we've got more in the office. If, if you haven't read John Stroop's book, From the Pit to the Pulpit, please grab a copy, read it, bring it back, and we'll get those out, and you can read and be impressed with what God did in his heart and his life. But we discussed these other individuals, even my son-in-law, and then we went on to, to read about Stephen, but who would be the greatest example of meeting with resistance? Jesus. I'm going to give you some references and then just a summation quickly of, of the resistance. And this is what I found looking at one of the Gospels, looking at Matthew, the resistance that he, that he faced. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. See it on the screen? The, the three 
extreme temptations of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness. And then Matthew 8, 28 through 34, Jesus confronted and defeated a group of demons. Then the people of the community were more interested in their finances rather than seeing miracles, and he was asked to leave. Matthew 9, 1 through 8, Jesus was confronted by religious leaders because he healed a paralyzed man and forgave his sins. In, in 9-11, Jesus was confronted by religious leaders about eating with people that needed help. 9-14, Jesus was confronted again by the religious leaders that, though, that thought that the disciples should fast as often as they did. In 9-24, Jesus was laughed at by a crowd who didn't think he could raise one little girl from the dead. Yeah. Matthew 9-34, the religious leaders said that Jesus cast demons out through Satan's power. And then in 11.20, Jesus spoke of cities that would not receive him. In 12.2, the religious leaders were critical of the disciples not following the law. In Matthew 12.10, the religious leaders didn't want Jesus to do a miracle on the Sabbath. And in 12.14, the Pharisees planned to kill Jesus. 12.22-24, Jesus healed a demon-possessed man that was blind and deaf. And Jesus is accused of using Satan's power yet again. And then Matthew 13, 30, or 53 through 58, you see it on the screen? All right. Jesus was resisted in the area where he was raised and did fewer miracles there because of their unbelief. Yeah. How about 14, verses 1 through 12? Jesus was told that his dear friend John the Baptist was killed by a wicked king that didn't want to be confronted by his sin. Matthew 15, 1 and 2, religious leaders confronted Jesus about his followers, again, and about not following the law. And 16, 1, the religious leaders were more interested in a sign than having a relationship to Jesus. And then in 16, 23, Peter, one of his own, resisted God's plan for Jesus. Peter, one of his own, resisted God's plan for Jesus. Okay, and then 17, 24 through 27, the tax collectors insisted that Jesus pay taxes, and Jesus paid from the mouth of a fish. And then some of you might say, well, see why I need to go ice fishing this afternoon, hon. Yeah, well, I tell you what, I have reference after reference after reference after reference. Um, in one place, in Matthew 22, 23 through 33, the Sadducees tried to propagate a false doctrine that there was no resurrection. But I, I remember as a young kid, I heard somebody say, well, you see, they were called Sadducees. That's why you, they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. I'm, all right, well, okay. Maybe the next guy will be more interesting. But anyway, it, you know, but it just goes on. One section of just one verse after another, after another, after another, after another. And then Matthew 27, 62 through 66, Jesus was was uh, sealed into a guarded tomb. And I skipped the part about the crucifixion. Uh, in Matthew 28, Jesus won after three years of the most serious resistance that this world has ever known. <laughs> but keep in mind, I thought of this, if, if you and I, if God stirs our heart and, and if we hit, a, hit some serious resistance and we come and drop before our Lord and Savior with bruises and cuts on us from our resistance, he can relate to us. Because he experienced resistance far beyond what you and I ever would or could. But as we continue this study, you need to understand that Jesus dealt with resistance through prayer. And the same thing is emulated by Nehemiah. He fought his resistance through prayer, and we're going to see that. But let me close with this. I want you to imagine four scriptures up here. 1 John 4, 4 says this. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So if we're, if we're fighting resistance, we can claim these promises. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the next one, 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You could say amen if you're listening to these. 
Romans 8, 37, they and all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Ephesians 6, 10, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So we've flown through that pretty quickly. But would you please do this? <clears throat> please bow your heads and close your eyes. <clears throat> I think we have experienced some resistance here this morning. Not that we have to have all this technology. But when it doesn't work, it just lends itself to causing disruption. But I tell you what, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Now let, let me just say this. Please keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. <clears throat> this morning in Sunday school, we talked about baptism. We talked about the reality that it's the next step to take to be obedient. After we've received Christ as our personal Savior, the next step is baptism. Because he's done so much for us, it's time to claim him. Now watch this. God's moving in hearts right now. God is stirring hearts right now. If you're here this morning, and if God's been working on your heart to get baptized, and you understand it, and you want to be obedient, would you please stand up? Maybe God's stirring your heart this morning to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if that's the case, would you please stand up? Maybe what you picked up on today was a white stick and a black stick stuck into the same bowl, stirring the same heart. And that is so descriptive through an illustration of exactly what you've allowed to happen in your life. If that's the case, would you please stand up? Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that you have stirred hearts here this morning. Nobody has stood up for any of those questions, any of those scenarios, but I don't think you're done yet. I believe that you're going to keep stirring at least for a while until someone either comes to know you as their personal Savior, but you may not keep stirring. Or some will come to the point and say, yes, I need to claim my Lord and my Savior in the waters of baptism. And you're stirring hearts this morning, but nobody's standing. But you're not done yet. And Father, truthfully, talking about the white stick and the black stick stirring a heart. There are entirely too many times in my life that that's been the case for me. So I stand before you this morning wanting to have you stir my heart and the best I can, this side of heaven, minimize Satan's influence and maximize what you can do with a stirred heart of a very average individual. 
Father, I'm just willing to do what you want me to do. And Father, there might be people sitting here right now that are just hanging out of their pew because you've stirred their heart. And maybe we haven't even mentioned how you're stirring their heart. But again, I'm going to be right here, and I might miss the class on how to handle the apparatus that can shock somebody back to life because I'd like to stand right here and see the Spirit of God and the Word of God cause somebody to be shocked into the reality that they're a sinner and they need Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Or whatever else somebody might want to talk about. I'll be right here. Bible in hand and the Spirit moving. So please, Father, keep stirring. Keep stirring my heart. Don't give up on me. I want to be stirred by you and respond by you, through you, by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.